All right, we are live. So we're just waiting. Yay. Tell me, are you going to introduce me first, Amy? Well, not till I know that people are watching. That I think I see like some, I think I see four likes. So maybe people are watching. I'm actually checking Facebook right now to see. Okay. If you want, actually, guys, post comments so I know you're here. <laughs> Whoa, that was weird. Loud and weird. <laughs> okay, it's almost seven. Now, who's talking right now? Neither of us. Oh, that was weird. There's a bird making noise. Oh. That bird is. That bird is. That bird is Hold on. We're having trouble streaming to your destination. Which destination? Oh, that. I'm not going to worry about that then. I'll just remove that one. Okay. Hold on. I know people. <laughs> okay. Hey, all right. I see some people. Okay. So, people, you can hear all that weird noise. That's um, some birds. What do you have there? Is it the guineas? The chickens. Uh, the chickens making a ruckus. Yeah, they're obnoxious because they're taking over the broadcast. <laughs> okay, well, all right. Um, everybody, this is Jonah Curtis. Um, he's on his uh, his homestead. <laughs> um, his wife is filming, so if you hear her talk, um, we may not hear her talk, but if we do, that's who that is. Um, that's Hannah. And um, the birds are being obnoxious. They have chickens and guineas, and I'm just going to show us uh, this, this little pot here, and I'm going to give it to him. He's oh, Jonah's master gardener. Um, what else do we need to know? Oh, runs the community garden at um, Oakland um, Life Improvement Center, and he's. Uh, I'm just going to give it to him because I'm just being awkward. So go for it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Jonah. Uh, I'm a homesteader and a gardener. Uh, I've been doing it basically my entire life. I grew up in northern Michigan um, on a little homestead with my folks and my grandparents, and we raised most of our own food. And I've really been passionate my whole life and continue to be so about our connection to food um, and how food connects us to one another. And uh, my, my formal training is in nutrition, so also how quality food affects our health and our lives. Um, and then how we can produce our own. So I've been running community garden for you know, a number of years now and teaching adult and children's gardening classes. Um, great time. Uh, the adults make fun of me a lot less than the kids do, but uh, the adults like fewer popsicles, so it's a good time for everybody. Um, one of the things that I get, I get a lot of questions every year at the beginning of the year on homesteading, gardening, how do I do this, how do I do that, either via text, email, DM, whatever. Um, this year I've gotten more than ever. And I think it's a number of things. I think people are, are um, interested in where the food comes from and the quality of it. Um, and I also think that people got a little a little startled this spring um, with everything that was going on when they went to the grocery store and there wasn't as much food as they expected. And so food security is another big thing for me. Um, behind me is one of the gardens, and with this, and then um, some homesteading, raising some animals, and a lot of hunting and fishing, I raise almost all of the food that my family consumes, and I give a lot away. If you're on my Christmas list, you get a cooler uh, full of canned goods and meat. Um, so um, I really enjoy doing that. It means a lot to me, and I really enjoy teaching people how to do that too. And if you're just getting started, which is kind of what we're covering tonight, you don't need to do this, not yet. This this is a build upon thing. Um, it takes years to do this and I'm still learning. You know, I'm pretty good at it, but I'm still learning. I still do some dumb stuff. I still experiment with some things and have better years and worse years. Um, when you're just getting started, you wanna start small and be successful and build upon that and develop a, a strategy and an education um, to work towards something. And, and it doesn't have to be your whole pantry um, filled like mine, a whole freezer. If you can fill one supper table one time, it'll mean a lot to you and whoever you share it with. Um, so we're going to cover that tonight. We're going to plant some really simple stuff, do a little kitchen garden. I'm going to talk a little bit 
about uh, starting some stuff on a, a patio if you don't have room for a garden. But we're going to plant tomatoes, um, peppers, eggplant, zucchini, Swiss chard, and basil. And with those ingredients, you can do a lot of meals. Uh, my wife made spaghetti tonight with three of those ingredients. And um, it's, it's an easy way to get started. So this is about a six and a half by six and a half foot little square. And we're going to build everything in there. So if you are just starting and you don't have a garden yet, it's not too late this year. But location is important. You want to have a spot in your yard. And basically all this was was a spot of yard that we dug up, sodded. And then we've had a garden here for a few years. So we've amended the soil over the years um, with compost and things like that. So it's a little bit better. But there's still stones in it. It's Michigan. So we've had glaciers move through here and there's stones everywhere. You'll never get them all out, even though I rake it every year. So you want to work on your soil. You want to work on your location. So you want something that will get, especially for what we're doing today, um, essentially full sun. In my garden, I have almost micro gardens within that of a little bit more shade, a little bit lower areas, a little bit drier areas, so that I can grow certain things throughout the season. This hey, um, is kind of Jack of all trades. Jace says hi. Lindsay Casey hi. says <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is kind of a jack of all trades type of garden, but it should do pretty well for everything. Uh, you want to make sure that you get full sun. So we have a tree right here, but it is north of where this garden will be. And we are in Michigan, so the sun is south of where this garden will be. So this is okay. It's a little bit sloped, so it's less than perfect, but I didn't want to dig out like 10 yards of soil just to square this up. So the two degrees of slope, it's okay. Um, I also uh, called down the rain today and pre-wetted the soil. So we're not going to have to wet in as much as we would normally, but we're still going to wet it in a little bit, and I'll talk a little bit about why. Um, big proponent of improving your soil constantly. You want to test when you first get started, and you can buy little pH tests. You can send stuff into MSU, things like that, if you really want to know, but at this point in the year, you can buy the store-bought ones. Most of the, the, the soil in Michigan is basic to just slightly acidic, so it should be okay um, with whatever you want to grow. And then you can amend it with some store-bought soil this year and then just keep improving that. All right. So that being said, let's get started. We're going to start with the uh, my favorite, some tomatoes. I love them. From my head, tomatoes. All right. So I like to use a mulch. And one thing I've been working on um, over the last couple of years, I use some plastic ones because they're effective, but I'm really trying to get away from that and do more paper. This is just some recycled scrap paper, and it works pretty well for a couple things. We're going to do some weed suppression in that it blocks light from the soil, so the weeds will have a difficult time growing through. It uh, maintains soil moisture by slowing evaporation, and it maintains soil heat by slowing the cooling process in the evening so the soil stays warmer throughout the night. So we are going to get started and do a tomato. So this is one that I started. So tomatoes have little hairs all throughout the stem. They're a vine. So the deeper you plant them, they will root. And this one, it's a little root bound, but not bad. So we're gonna start by placing this where we want it. And we're just going to bury the corners a little bit. Oh, and Mr. Toad is joining us in the garden. And Hannah read my mind. Moving closer. I like it. <laughs> and then X marks the spot in Indiana Jones and gardening. <laughs> so we're just going to make room for it. Dig a little bit of soil up. Dirt is what we clean from our fingernails and sweep the floors with. We plant in soil. So, and I like to use some of my soil from my worm castings um, when I put it in. It's just some high octane worm poop that really gets things rocking and rolling. And I go just a little bit deeper. I don't go hog wild. It kind of depends on the tomato. This one's pretty solid looking. 
So I'm going to go just a little below the line of where it was. And we're going to pack that down a little bit. Pack the edges. Just so it doesn't blow away. And I'm sure that the rain that will be soaking me here in a few minutes will also wet this nicely. And it'll help this tomato to really thrive and get off to a good start. All right. We're going to do another one over here. And if it weren't raining, you'd have to water it, of course, right? Uh, we're going to water them both in anyway once we get them going. Okay. We're going to water everything in. So even though the soil, it's rained a little bit, um, but the soil is still not as damp. So these have been watered. I've been all over watering these. These are off to a great start. There are a lot of varieties of tomatoes. These are both indeterminate. So there's determinate and indeterminate. And essentially that's whether they're canning or um, slicing tomatoes. And these are both, um, actually this one is a cherry tomato. That one is an indeterminate. So it's a slicer, season long slicer. Um, when you're just getting started, unless you're going to do some canning, I would look for indeterminate tomatoes. They'll give you tomatoes throughout the growing season. They're great slicers. And they're fairly easy to take care of. Well, I've been watering these. So this soil is more moist than this soil. Soil wants to reach an equilibrium. So if I were to just put this in here without watering any of this, the soil that I'm putting it in would leach from this and dry this tomato out. It's kind of counterintuitive, but it's just the way that it works. So when you plant anything from a moist environment, you really want to be sure to water it in well. Um, I, it's probably going to rain, so I'm going to be a little redundant in my watering it in, but you want to water it in well just to make sure that it's happy. Jade wants to know how you protect against veggie thieves, rabbits, moles, chipmunks, etc., while the plants are taking root. That is a great question. So moles are pretty tough. You essentially have to trap them. Um, rabbits and chipmunks are the same thing. You really have to trap them. There's no deterrent that I trust that will just keep them away unless you have a really um, useful cat or, or dog. Uh, other than that, you can trap them and dispatch them. I feed them to my chickens, but that's neither here nor there. So um, anything else you wanna make sure everything is fenced and really secure. If you do not have a fence around your garden, what you have is not a garden, it is a wildlife viewing station. And that's fine if you wanna see wildlife, but I really recommend a, gar or a, a fence around your garden. And with rabbits, I just run around my regular fence. I'll run a little bit of chicken wire along the bottom and that really keeps them out. Um, I don't like to use a cat if I can avoid it because I like songbirds and even though they're hard on chipmunks, they're also hard on songbirds. So that's really my best advice is traps for rodents and moles. Um, in the fall, you can do some um, efforts to get rid of moles, but once they're in in the summer, it's pretty much trapping or living with them. Um, that's really about it. I've seen some people put a pillar around their tomatoes in the ground to keep moles out, but I doubt its efficacy. It probably makes you feel better, but I don't know that it really works very well. So I hope I answered that question. Maybe plant more than you need to help. Yeah, plant, <laughs> if, that's the other thing. If you, uh, if you don't want a fence, plant enough to share. That's okay too. I'm pretty generous with the birds, um, with the uh, some of the things, but I put a net over my blueberries. I don't share blueberries. Oh no. And if you hear a dog whining in the background, that's because we normally have our dogs in the garden with us. And one of our dogs is rather bitter about being excluded this evening. All right. So we're going to get this down nice and deep. And Jade said, thank you. You are welcome. Jade. And there are several other people who are um, excited to be here and just want to say hi. Well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. I uh, hope you get something out of this. And I'm happy to answer questions during this or after. Um, I'll make my social media available, and you can ask me questions on there. And again, this is some of my um, vermiculture soil. I use worms in my compost, and it's essentially worm poop, but it is very high octane for starting uh, seedlings. So I'm going to grab a little water. And we're going to kind of water in as we go. I recommend a red coffee can. Blue is okay when you're watering in. 
And we're just going to kind of get the soil a little bit damp around there. And there we go. And that should do it. And as uh, the nice thing about this paper, and I'm going to use some in the community garden this year also, is that it can be tilled in. You don't have to clean it up. It's essentially, you know, it's organic matter. So it can be tilled in and you don't have to pull it up at the end of the year and it's not leaching anything in. Because it's just recycled, dye-free paper. All right. So we are going to do some zucchini. Everyone makes fun of zucchini because they grow too much, but it is awesome. So a little bit about spacing now that we've got a couple things going here. Um, I try and keep tomatoes three to four feet apart, but because we're doing kind of a high intensity garden, having a lot of stuff here, we're gonna grow a few things um, closer than I would normally grow them, but they're not super competitive with one another. And I have put a lot of organic matter in the soil, so it should be able to do it. And I'll keep up throughout the season and make sure that everything is, is where it needs to be. You also want to think about, particularly with um, squashes and low, low vegetables like that, they, in Michigan, it is moist every evening, basically. And so the dew that sets, if it doesn't have an opportunity to dry, turns to mildew and rot. So with cucumbers and zucchini in particular, but other bushy squashes, uh, you want to make sure that there's enough airflow. So with cucumbers and some squashes, I'll trellis them. With zucchini, I'll hill them a little bit just to get enough airflow through there so that they, they're happy. Uh, so that by the time the sun hits them, they're essentially already dry and that there's no powdery mildew issues. So we're going to make a little hill. And I'm going to space these out just a little bit. They're going to be a little closer than I would normally do, but I'll probably actually cull. Um, I have four plants here, but I'm going to put them two or together. I'll probably cull them a little bit and pull one and see who looks, who looks better as we go. I have the most confidence in this guy because there's two. So we've held it just about five inches here. And then... We're going to pack them in a little bit, gently nestle them in. We're going to do another one here. All right. We're going to pack a little more soil around there so that's a little more structurally sound. And you can see you can see the quality of some of the soil here. I've got worms for days there. So we're going to pack this with just some of my high octane stuff, some of my worm castings. This is also what I use to start a lot of my seeds. And we'll dump that out. No, oh, little guy. All right, so these guys should get enough airflow, especially because most of the wind comes out of the west. It'll blow through here um, and keep them pretty happy and without getting any mildew. So our zucchini is in, and now we're just going to wrap up this half of the garden by doing a little trellising with these tomatoes. So there are some options here. The standard store-bought tomato cage. These are okay. They're, they're fine. Um, I like something with a little more structure because I don't prune my tomatoes a ton. So I let them, I kind of spread them around. And you'll see that behind me, I use a lot of fencing for tomato trellis. And I'll spread tomatoes along it. And they're, I've had a lot of success with that. They stay pretty happy. But um, in this area, what I do is use these guys. So this is actually concrete uh, rebar, concrete backing that you'd pour or you'd put if you were pouring concrete. And it adds a lot of structure. I It seems like you'd want to put the tomato right in the center, but I actually kind of put it offset a little bit. And that way it'll grow toward one side and I'll spread it out throughout. Then I drive a stake. And here we have 
one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century, Velcro. This is reusable. This is how I tie up essentially all of my tomatoes and all of my mining plants. Just little strips of rolls, reusable for years and years and years. So I just put one around, make it kind of tight. And as this tomato grows, I'll use Velcro as it goes up and around and kind of prune it a little, but basically use this cage to provide structure to the vine. All right, we're going to do one more on this one. All right. Again, just a little offset. And you don't have to drill to the center of the earth, but uh, we, we get wind gusts around here of like 50 miles an hour every time it storms. So some, a fair amount of structure is not a bad idea. And this should hold it as we go. All right. So we have, next we are going to do some peppers and then we're going to do some peppers and then some eggplant and then kind of build around that. So these are store-bought jalapenos. I usually start my sweet peppers from seed, but the jalapenos, um, I don't need very many, so I just buy those. All right. So we'll do those here. And again, a little bit of spacing. And I'm gonna come through and put flowers in the corners. So I leave a little bit of space in the corner and I'm just gonna put some, a little bit of marigolds in there. So we'll go about right here. Now these guys only need about a square foot or so each. Tomatoes need a bit more than that. And now with tomatoes, we can plant them deep because they will root along the vine. Peppers are not so. With really any other plant that you're planting, you generally want to go stick with basically the soil level that we had. Uh, if you go any higher, if you tension it too tight, it almost girdles the plant and doesn't allow nutrient to flow back and forth. So we're going to go just essentially at ground level. And I usually do a little bit more because I find that the seed starting mix dries out a little bit more quickly. And so I will just cover a little to avoid uh, the moisture loss to, through the air. All right, so then if we do our next one right about here, it should be pretty happy. A little over a foot away. We're gonna put the jalapeno in there. I can already taste the uh, stuffed jalapenos on the grill. Fire up the grill, basically ready already. All right, and that's about it for planting depth on those. Let's square that up a little bit. And I'm gonna water the rest of these in right at the end so that we can kind of get some more stuff in the ground. So on the other side, I, I don't love symmetry. I know I don't need symmetry, but I enjoy symmetry. So we have the, the tomatoes and the uh, zucchini in a fashion there. We have peppers on this side. On their opposite, we're going to put some eggplant. Now, eggplant is okay for me. My wife <laughs> and my mother-in-law love eggplant. So I grow a lot of eggplant. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna try and line up with essentially the same spot and square it up. And about there. Jim Hadsma again, says, yeah. sorry um, to break in. Jim Hadsma says, thank you for presenting this on Facebook Live. My pleasure. <laughs> and thank you for no one commenting on how sweaty I am. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> in the kids gardening class, they always make fun of me for that. <laughs> but then I put their popsicles way up high and make fun of them for being short. All right, I need to grab my soil. All right. Did you say you, you uh, grow the, or the, you have the worms that make the castings, or do you buy that? Uh, I have those. Okay. I, I have, um, they are 
two by four frames. Um, they're about, oh, what are they? Uh, probably about 12 by 16, something like that. And they're two by fours with a hardware cloth. And I stack them and add compost. And then I added worms from our big compost. I have some inside. I'm trying three different ways. I have two inside, one with night crawlers, one with leaf worms, red worms, one outside with red worms. And then I rotate the stack through. And as the worms eat everything and they waste it, mm -hmm. um, all the box is essentially filled with worm poop, which is about as good of soil as you're going to get. I, it just is top notch for adding to anything. So, yeah, I have I have three boxes going of worm castings. And it's what I usually start my seeds in, uh, and then I usually have quite a bit left over, and I'll add it, and I'll add it to the greenhouse as I go. All right, so we're going to go back to the other side, and we are going to – so we have our peppers in and our eggplant in. We still have to water them in, but now we're going to talk about, in my opinion, the most underrated green there is. Swiss chard. If I put lettuce in here, it would be pretty sad most of the year. Uh, it's just too hot a lot of the time for lettuce to be in full sun, in my opinion. It's wilty and it gets bitter quickly. Swiss chard is much more durable. It's a little bit tougher, but it's also more versatile. It'll last longer in the refrigerator. You can cook it like you would spinach, or you can eat it fresh like you would in a salad. I do recommend cutting it first thing in the morning, and it's much better. And if you cut it later in the day, uh, it's kind of an old timey one. I'm really trying to bring it back into vogue. Let's make Swiss chard cool again, please. <laughs> All right. So I have some seeds that we're going to put in on that side. But these are some that I started in my greenhouse. And we're going to put them right here. And we don't have to worry a ton about spacing with the tomato because they're not super competitive with one another. So, yeah, these you can use... Like you could use, I mean, they're really versatile. You could honestly darn near use them like you could cabbage or collard greens. Uh, I'm not going to pull them apart. I'm just going to put them in as is. And they'll be plenty happy because I have really good soil in there. And we're just going to nestle them in. And they look like they're a little bit smushed. But as soon as they get a little bit of water, uh, they are going to pop right up and be just killer. And they grow pretty large, too. And there's kind of a lot of varieties of colors. And... I'm a big fan of color varietals in food. You eat with your eyes first. And so if we have, like these ones are kind of have a pinkish hue to them. I have some that we're going to plant, uh, some more like that. I have some over there that have a magenta. I have some yellowish ones. Uh, there's some candy cane striped ones that are very fancy that I like. Um, all right, so let's do, we'll do one more row about right here. That way there's room to weed in between. You want to leave yourself room to work or to put your feet. I have done that before. Uh, it's a common mistake and one that I continue to make where I plant things too close together and I uh, forget that I have giant ogre feet. And then so I can't get in between them. And then my wife has to weed the garden. It's the worst. Yes. Um, yeah. Or I have to go on my tiptoes barefoot. <laughs> and I am almost exactly as delicate as I look. So that doesn't work very well. And I switch things. And don't be afraid to dig with your hands. Getting your hands in the soil does, it really does wonders. And that's one of the coolest things um, that I've seen with the kids gardening class. How'd you get in here? You're lettuce. But well, we're going to put you in there anyway. We'll just eat you sooner. Um, one of the coolest things I've seen in the kids gardening class, and I talk about this all the time, is that when you just see a tomato, it's just objective. It's just a tomato. But when you grow it, it's my tomato. And when I have kids do that, it really makes my day. But having adults do it too, it just changes the way you view your food. It's not just a thing, it's your thing. And when you give it to someone else, you are, you're providing nourishment um, and a part of yourself, like something you worked for. And you know the look. When someone hands you food that they worked on, they have a, a look of anticipation on their face that is just awesome because they want to see you enjoy it. And that's one of the, receiving that is fantastic, but giving it is awesome too. I love giving food away because I love seeing people enjoy it. 
in fact, that's about the only request I make when I give food away is you have to send me pictures of what you cook. And I get a lot of cool texts um, from people who made awesome meals with food that I gave them. And that's, that's all I'm looking for out of this deal. I just want to see it. All right, so let's put some Swiss chard seed on that side. We haven't put any seed yet in, so we'll talk about that. So we're going to do, we're just going to do some fancy stuff. Put you away for now. So this is, oh, this is the fancy stuff. So we have the pink Swiss chard, which I have some over there. And then we have some magenta, which is my third favorite crayon right behind burnt sienna. All right. So we are going to trough some rows here. And we'll start with the magenta. Man, now I want to smell some crayons. Do we have any crayons? <laughs> also, Hannah and I recently found out that we are pregnant with our first child. So I am going to be growing um, a lot of, maybe not new foods, but using them in new ways to try and make all of our baby food. And I'll also get to play with crayons again. All right, so we have those in. I'm going to put some soil over them right now. And if you're doing a big garden, I recommend row markers. Um, the nice thing about this is it's on video, so if I forget what I planted, I can review this video and remember. But usually row markers are a good idea. I also record most of my stuff um, or plan it out. And I'll show you that real quickly. So, okay, I'll say it. That's brilliant. I never thought to do that. <laughs> I tend to almost maniacally. Jade says, "Congrats." I almost maniacally. Thank you. <laughs> I almost maniacally plan my garden, like down to scratch and scratch writing. Uh, and I think that's a really not to put too fine a point on, but I think that's a really good idea because uh, I all, don't always have a great memory of, in fact, here's a, a bad memory spot. I forgot a row that I had in my garden. I had to add it later. Um, I don't always have a great memory of exactly what I planted. And when I start my seeds, uh, I write it in code so no one knows. No, just bad handwriting. But it's important to write stuff down because, as Adam Savage says, if you're not writing it down, you're just screwing around. Um, and my memory is somewhat faulty. So when you write stuff down, plan it out, you can make sure that you have enough room for everything you want to put in and that you remember what you put in. Uh, Cause when a seedling comes up and you're scratching your head about what exactly it is, is not a great feeling. If you're wondering if you need to trellis it or if you need to eat it now, is that basil? Is that a cucumber? I don't know. So write it down um, either beforehand or as you go. All right, so speaking of basil, which has one of my all-time favorite snacks. And also one of the most popular Christmas gifts that I give away, uh, packs of frozen pesto with walnuts, not with pine nuts. Pine nuts are terrible. That's, that's subjective. But I don't love pine nuts. So basil we're going to put in from seed, just like we would, or just like we did with the uh, seeded so just a couple packs of basil. Again, we have plenty of room here, and we're going to do it. See, the zucchini will come out about to probably here and to the edge of the, the uh, chard. So we're going to go about here, here, and somewhat symmetrical right there, and do three rows of basil. And when you make soup, you can call it tomato basil and sound very fancy. <laughs> you could just plant that so, whole garden in basil and I'd be happy. I know. And it <laughs> smells so good. Oh, it smells so good. I don't even care if I eat it half the time. My brother oh, loves no. it. So I do grow some for him. Some of this is, uh, Kyle, if you're watching, some of this is yours, buddy. <laughs> 
and I play it kind of heavy. Um, as it comes up, I, I may thin, and I've even moved it before where it didn't come up as well. And it's okay. When they're just little inch tall seedlings, um, don't be shy about just scooping it with your finger and moving it. Or if it all comes up super well, uh, you can transfer it to a pot or to a different place in your garden. I've had times where flowers didn't do super well. I always plant flowers at the ends of my rows. And I've had times where they didn't do very well. And I'll just transplant basil to the ends of my rows. It's as pretty as a flower. It smells better than a lot of flowers. It's fine. It's pretty and we just work with what we have sometimes. All right. So these guys are going to be happy. With seeds like basil and lettuce, I don't cover them much more than just about a quarter inch. So more or less just kind of this technique of dusting um, some high octane but light soil. So in Michigan, we also have, it depends on where we are, but in certain spots of Michigan, we can have very sandy soil. We can have just excellent, excellent gardening soil. We can have some peaty soil. Move the worms back in there. Go in there, guys. Um, or we can have one of the biggest problems for me and in this area, which is a lot of clay in the soil. And what that does is it kind of puts a, almost a crust once it gets wet over the soil. And then these little guys just can't power through. So I like to use a lighter soil, a fluffier soil, usually the stuff I make myself. And it really helps um, give them space to work through without having to be suppressed. Oh, somebody right. just so, noticed your shirt and their fan. I can't. Hey. <laughs> Hunty. Oh, Hunt to eat, yes. <laughs> All right, so we're going to put in some marigolds. I know they're just plain Jane little flowers, but I still think they're cool. Um, I, I don't know if they do a lot to uh, – there's some old wives' tales and maybe some evidence that they help. Uh, with pest problems, but I'm skeptical. But it doesn't matter. They're pretty. And they're very hardy and require extremely low maintenance. So these I will not have to deal with again other than maybe deadheading them. And they will be pretty all season. And sometimes I don't even dig. I'll basically put like a little wedge and just use the edge of my spade to kind of form a dam to keep the soil back and then let it go. Clean up after myself. All right. Number three is kind of a, a little stunted, but I believe in him. He's going to thrive here for many months to come, and we'll give him every opportunity to do so. The last little friend, we're going to place this pretty little gal right here. Happy, happy, happy. All right, so we're going to water stuff in, even though it looks like... Uh, Mother Nature might be watering things in. And if you're gardening, start collecting five-gallon pails now. And if you're homesteading, <laughs> start having all your friends collect five-gallon pails now. You cannot have enough. Don't stack them. Okay, There's Jade's there. asking about snakes. Do you get snakes in your garden? And I can say yes, I've been there. <laughs> yes. I have lots of snakes. I love snakes. I actually try and create an environment where snakes are happy here. Because I have snakes, I don't have very many slugs. I have very few mice. The only thing, they do eat frogs, and I like frogs, but, you know, we, we work with what we have. But these mulches are full of snakes. The greenhouse, full of snakes. Um, I try to have some rock piles, and those will kind of hold chipmunks too. But if I get rid of the chipmunks, and the snakes will get rid of baby chipmunks. Um, the snakes do a great job of pest control. I get asked a lot of pest control questions. I don't have a ton of problems with it because I have a lot of snakes. Now, I'm a very tough guy, but they are startling when I grab one when I'm pulling weeds and I yank up a snake. I'm not proud of some of the noises I make, but 
I still love having them around. Um, yeah, I, I encourage having an environment where snakes are happy. Well, what kind? I see mostly gardener snakes or garter, garter snakes. snakes. Yeah, garter snakes. Um, I, the only I've seen a, a couple of milk snakes and rat snakes here, and a blue racer every once in a blue moon. But garter snakes, a hundred to one over anything else I see here. So probably nothing more than a gardener snake, snake in like the suburbs, wouldn't you say? What's that? Probably none of the blue racers or any of the weird ones in the suburbs. Um, I don't know. I've never been to the suburbs, That's but true, you know. <laughs> um, I'm sure there are snakes there. They're probably maybe not because some of them, um, some of them require a little more wilderness than would be available there. But a milk snake would not shock me to see in the suburbs or a rat snake. Probably not a blue racer, but lots of garter snakes for sure. This and is when I, you're I, supposed I really to tell people not to be afraid. This is people <laughs> should not be afraid of them. No, um, they're not going to go after you, right? In Michigan, in Michigan, there are a venomous snake is extremely rare. We basically have two varieties, really only one. And I'm out more than about anybody. And I've only seen them a couple times in my life. And I spend a lot of time outdoors. You're not going to see one. They're not going to harm you. Most of you, all the snakes you will see in your life will not be venomous. They will be harmless snakes. We're just trying to do snake stuff. Um, and they're not harmful to your garden whatsoever. I really try and have a live and let live approach with critters unless I'm going to eat them or they're harming things I'm going to eat. Uh, I have eaten a few rattlesnakes out west, but snakes don't really harm you. They won't harm your garden. Just leave them alone. Uh, try to be courageous when you see one. And not be startled. <laughs> they are startling. They are startling. There's just some visceral reaction to a snake that they are they are startling. And when you see a big lump in one, you wonder what it was. I do wonder that. That's pretty cool. And we'll just water these in a little bit. I, I usually kind of side water rather than run it right out um, over what I just planted. It'll make the soil around it moist enough and it should be happy. All right, so here in about 40 minutes, we planted a little kitchen garden. Um, so as we go on through the summer, I should get, well, I'll get a lot of cherry tomatoes off this. This I'll probably get, with this variety, probably a half a bushel of tomatoes. Um, innumerable zucchini off these, very likely. And the more you pick, uh, the more you get. I do a few things to, well, I keep bees which helps with the pollination. I also, um, the wind helps, but I, I'll do a little finessing with some of my tomato plants to try and increase pollination. Um, the zucchini, they have a male and a female flower. So generally you're just hoping bees will do it. And we have a lot of honeybees, a lot of bumblebees, a lot of mason bees. We usually get pretty good pollination around here and we freeze um, many, I should weigh them sometime, but I would say in the neighborhood of 60 to 80 pounds of zucchini a year that we use in soups and sauces and different things like that. Um, this chard will be rocking and rolling and really is edible now, but in the next few weeks we'll start picking that. Then this will be following it. The basil should be popping within about seven to 10 days. Both pepper plants um, and both eggplants should be producing by late July at the latest. Um, uh, Alicia has a question about growing in containers, what the best things are for that. Sounds good. We'll talk about that right now. Uh, one more thing before we move on to the containers, a little bit about what I call or what is called succession planting. So as this Swiss chard is toast and we eat it um, and it gets too, too stocky, uh, too little leaf, I will pull it and I will plant a cool weather crop here. Probably more Swiss chard, actually, because this will probably be gone by July. And I'll try and pick a cool, wet day. And I'll plant uh, some more Swiss chard or maybe some beets, something like that, that has, you know, a 50-day-ish, 60-day growing season. And then by September, I'll have another crop in this spot. So just because a crop is done doesn't mean that spot is done. You can keep planting. So let's talk a little bit about container gardening. So we have a few options. And I do some, even though I have all this space to garden. Um, right here, I have some peas that I have going in a container with a little trellis around them. Uh, why? Just because I wanted to see how it would go. And so I'll be having peas out of this pretty shortly. There's also some mustard greens going on in there. 
I have peanuts growing back here that I started um, a little bit late, but I think they'll do well. I like to do peanuts in pots because I love alliteration and because pots tend to get a little bit warmer and peanuts are a southern crop, so they do pretty well. Uh, I have some strawberries that, quite frankly, I just didn't have room for in the garden. So I have about six random pots of strawberries around here. I have a bunch of old tubs full of garlic uh, as an experiment on how they'll grow. And your, skull, your skull did um, not escape notice. What's that? Your skull did not escape notice. Oh, oh and that, your garden with fun stuff, that is a from a plastic. I did that in the kids' gardening class. Among other things, the skull out of context is kind of strange. I'll grant you that. But there were some other decorations that we did um, in the toward the fall. And that was a plastic skull. I cut a hole in the back and the kids all made decorations. And then you uh, fill it with concrete. You mix concrete and you pour into the plastic skull that you get at the dollar store. And boom, you have a cool skull. And that's painted glow in the dark. Uh, and I feel like it keeps <laughs> goblins and such out of my garden. Or maybe draws in the protective goblins. I don't know. But the garden works well, and I like the skull glowing in the dark. So um, for container gardening, there are a lot of different sizes. So this is about a two-gallon little guy. And I've got strawberries growing in that. And these are just ones that I had that I bought trees in, or this might have been a blueberry or raspberry or something like that. And you can hold those, or you can buy fancy ones, or, which is a lot of what I do, is I'll use these and put something fancy around it. Because a lot of the fancy pots are kind of fragile. So you can do this. And if the pot breaks, which I've had several shatter, you don't lose your plants. Because it's a little disheartening to come out and have a shattered pot lead to a shattered look of shattered tomatoes. Um, so these guys are store-bought. They're pretty simple. They're two and a half gallon little pots. And you could grow most varieties of tomatoes in here. A lot of them you'll want maybe three to five gallons for some big tomatoes, but a lot of patio tomatoes do fine in here. Now these don't have, they have drainage and you want some drainage. You do not want to put gravel at the bottom. That's kind of a, another old gardening fable. Don't put gravel at the bottom. It turns to concrete. You want good drainage, but maybe have a container that won't allow it to fully drain. And these will get warm. So if you have these on your patio, put them in somewhere that'll get full sun for any fruiting plants you know, eight hours a day, but you also want to make sure that you water them basically every day and keep on top of it. Cause if they get dried out, it, it's pretty hard on them. It can shock them. So yeah, these you can pick up for, I don't know. These are probably six, eight bucks, maybe 10 bucks. And they'll last for a few years and they come with essentially a trellis built in and any patio tomato won't overwhelm this, or you could do peppers or eggplant. Now this, a tree came in uh, it works very well. It's three gallons, so it works for most tomatoes. And if you put it right on the ground, even though there's drainage, it, it won't flood out. It'll stay fairly moist as we go. And you can build, use uh, the store-bought ones. That works. Can be modified over it. Or you can just drop this in. So if you're planting a tree and you have a container left over, you can easily use any trellis and grow in that. And these, there are fancier ones. I, I like some of the fancier ones, but a lot of them are designed to uh, attract gardeners, not grow gardens. And they look really nice, but they don't always work really well. So make sure you run it by somebody who knows what they're doing, because some of them are just more flash than substance. One that I do like, and it's great for beginner gardeners. Um, it's not great for every plant, but... And there are a lot of containers like this. And there are some pots like tomato, eggplant, pepper pots. They're like this. Self-watering. This reservoir is full of water. So I had some stuff in here. You can hear it. Sashing. So you can fill this with soil. And I got these for my nephews. And they grew a bunch of strawberries in here. They've grown Swiss chard. They've grown lettuce. Uh, it works really well. And they're fairly inexpensive. And they last for a long, long time. And they're ones that'll fit over a rail on your on your deck. I guess my bottom line is with container gardening, you don't have to spend a ton of money if you don't want to. I mean, people may be impressed by your fancy containers, but I'd rather be impressed by fancy tomatoes. So there are a number of ways to go about it. You can these are probably thirty dollars, but they'll last you for years and years, and they give you a little wiggle room in that they self water. 
I mean, you still have to water them, but they have a reservoir that the roots can draw from that can buy you some time if three days later you're like, man, I feel like there's something I do every morning that I haven't done in a couple of days. And that thing is water your plants. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it for container gardening. There are baskets. There are gimmicky ones that I don't really buy into, like the upside down tomatoes. They kind of work, but not really. Tomatoes don't want to grow down. You'll get some, but they're kind of a hassle. They're just kind of a kind of a gimmick. Um, you can do hanging baskets. I have some hanging baskets over there with strawberries in them. I've done hanging baskets with uh, lettuce and Swiss chard and greens, almost like a flowering basket where there's stuff flowing over, but I eat it as I walk by. The tomato or the strawberries I have in hanging baskets are just a, a treat for when I'm sweaty and grumpy out here. I'll have a few little strawberries and power into the next move. Um, but yeah, so I guess we have started a six by six kitchen garden that will provide us with a couple bushels of food anyway. And we've discussed some container gardening and some garden placement. Um, the only other thing I kind of want to talk about, and I've touched on it a little bit, is fertilizer. Uh, fertilizer is fine to use. You may need it. Uh, if you don't test your soil, you don't know what you need. So I would, if you're not going to test your soil, I would start with a pretty light fertilizer, um, light in terms of volume and in terms of application rate, and just kind of assess where things are. Because you can over fertilize, you can over water, you can do, you can have the best intentions and do too much. So generally when you're first starting, ease into it. And then as you progress, my goal is always to use less and less fertilizer and to have a higher and higher quality soil. So I use a lot of composting. We compost basically all of our organic material. And sometimes we compost it directly into the vermiculture bins that the worms eat. And other things I will compost through the digestive tract of rabbits, goats, and chickens and use their manure in my compost and in my garden the following year and just to try and increase efficiency. Um, and that stuff is, is obviously high octane, let's grow vegetables, uh, soil. So yeah, I think we've covered all I really wanted to cover. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll listen to them now. You can also follow me on Instagram at Mighty Musquatch. I know it's hard to spell. You'll figure it out. Um, and I will answer basically any gardening question. I never sleep. So any time of day or night, you can send me a question and I will answer it. But if you send me a message after 10 p.m., I'll probably text you back at four in the morning when I get up. So I do sleep a little. Um, so does anyone have any questions right now? How do you sign up for my kids' gardening class and what kind of popsicles do we have? Firecracker? <laughs> Unless it's been really hot and then we do fudgicles if it's been a tough day. <laughs> All right. How do we spell musquatch? Or mighty? Okay. You don't know, do you? I, I'm sorry. How, how do you spell musquatch? Oh, um, M-U-S-K-Q-U-A-T-C-H. Got it. So at Mighty Musquatch. And Jade wants to know bugs that destroy plants. What do you do about them? Keep snakes in your garden. Um, <laughs> I, I don't like to use, I'm consuming this food. So I really try to avoid using poisons whenever possible. So that's a great question. Um, the biggest thing for me is prevention. Once the bugs are in there, you're going to have a hard time. Like a squash vine borer, once they're in your zucchini, you're toast. They'll get in there and the plant is just going to wither and die. So you want to stay on top of it. And that's why, especially if you have a small garden, it's not that hard. Just give it a once over every day or so. And you'll turn the leaves over. If you see any signs of infestation, turn the leaves over. Most critters will lay eggs on the bottom side of leaves or like a tomato hornworm, or it's actually a tobacco hornworm, but the, the hornworm you see on a tomato, it will chew. And it's usually the top leaves and they are gigantic. If you can look back, I'll show some. I had some that were bigger than my finger last year. They were, it was me or them. They're man eaters. <laughs> um, but basically I start with inspection and trying to stay out in front of them because once they're in there, they multiply at a rate that is difficult for a human to conceive and keep up with. So stay out in front. Then you can use some poisons. You know, there are things like 
uh, seven dust and different variations of it that will kill a lot of those bugs. But I'm not a huge proponent of putting any toxins on anything I'm going to consume. So I use a lot of diatomaceous earth and spread that around. I'll use some neem oil. Um, those are kind of my go-to and they're more of a deterrent than a killer. If you have slugs, you can use a uh, cheap beer and a Frisbee and the slugs will go in there and, and drown. And that their big problem, um, cutworms, when you're first starting can be a problem. You'll see like this, this pepper plant, I can come back tomorrow and it looks like Paul Bunyan came in there and just chopped it down. And what that was, a little tiny worm, a cutworm that goes in there and just chews it and timber and down it goes. I'm like, dude, why? And they'll do it with five instead of just eating one. But you can stop that with actually a little chunk of uh, toilet paper roll, which everyone's been hoarding. So we can put those around there. Um, any kind of barrier. But again, the diatomaceous earth works for that. For us, it's like a fine little sandy powder. For them, it's um, like one of Amy's favorite songs, Walking on Broken Glass. And it's it will stop them. Uh, yeah, so those are kind of my go-to. I guess if I had to pick a couple, diatomaceous, well, Prevention, diatomaceous earth, and then neem oil is kind of my other one. There's a question about guinea pig poop. Is that good in the compost bin? It's a carry one. Heck guinea yeah, it would be, it's essentially, they have about the same digestive system as a rabbit. So it'd be very good. Um, I don't know for sure how efficiently they they consume, but I, I don't think it'd be very high in nitrogen. I imagine you could almost use it right on plants. It might be a little seedy in that if they were eating hay, uh, there could be seeds still in it, so you might get some weeds. But I don't think it would burn any plants. You could probably put that right on, but you could certainly compost it, and it would work. Absolutely. I think. I don't want guinea pigs. <laughs> I just read a thing um, where someone <laughs> claims that they <clears throat> have five guinea pigs that they use to mow their lawn. They must not have a very big lawn or they have really hungry <laughs> guinea pigs, but I use rabbits to mow. I have little cages that I move around with rabbits that mow a lot of this. Yeah. Um, I mean, I still have to get out the mower for sure, but they're a lot smaller than I've got some pretty chunky rabbits <laughs> and a lot of them. Let's see if there's anything. It might be something new. Let's see. Oops. Um, some, a lot of people saying thank you. Um, Thank you. No, thanks for coming. Um, I learned a lot. I hope I didn't talk too fast. If I did, again, ask me questions whenever. Um, it doesn't have to be just gardening questions. I am pretty knowledgeable, not to uh, uh, my own horn, but I'm pretty knowledgeable on homesteading, uh, on homesteading stuff and food preservation type of things. And I love sharing that information i probably overshare that information especially because i ruminate on things and just think about things a lot so i do a lot of like homesteading or gardening experiments so i have a lot of weird things that may or may not work out so don't always try just because i show something because it may be an utter failure but sometimes they work sometimes they were good ideas like the rabbit lawnmower good idea <laughs> And thank you to whoever stopped most of the rain from drowning me out here. That was nice. Whoever, whichever one, I know one of you did it. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was really worried. I'm glad that the weather held out. Yeah. Oh, you were worried inside about me getting wet. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> well, That's so nice. You know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> getting wet, I didn't care. The rain and the thunder, you know, thunder and lightning. That's what I know. <laughs> That's the point. Well, yeah. All right. Um, it was perfect. You ended right, you know, one hour. Good job. Um, thanks right. everybody for watching and um, thanks everyone. Let's, let's hope we can do this again. Yeah, hope so. All right, all have a good night. Thanks everyone. <laughs>